had to navigate the issue of race very carefully despite being the first black president. He has very rarely ventured into the issue and when he has, it hasn't always gone well. Now the Trayvon Martin case has put it front and centre and it is just one of the many unwanted challenges of Obama's second term. Turmoil in the Middle East, cyber security, the embarrassment of the Edward Snowden whistleblower saga, all to varying degrees undermining Obama's attempts to shape his second term. Let's bring in Adam Lockyer now from the US Study Centre. Nice to have you here. Good Let's look, first of all, with the, the Zimmerman case, um, how, what sort of bind is Obama in here? He's the first black president who really can't speak about race. Exactly right. And he fell into the trap early on in his presidency when you remember that Henry Louis Gatz was caught mm. breaking into his own house. He was mm. a Harvard professor returning from a trip overseas to China. The police arrested him for breaking his own house. Obama chimed in and said that the, the police were at fault here, that they shouldn't have arrested him, and that got him to all sorts of political trouble. So he learned his lesson, and he's always tried to stay away from race, at least publicly, um, these really controversial race issues ever since. But something like this, where you have people out on the streets, passions are running high, um, a boy has been killed, how does he avoid it? I mean, it's, it's really the elephant in the room for him, isn't it? It is, and, but I think that uh, he will try and pick his fights, and this is one he won't try to get involved with um, in, in any sort of real meaningful sense. He won't try and be a community leader in, in this case um, because it is such a poison chalice for him. If you look at right across, there are so many issues on his desk right now, so he's dealing with that. He's also got the, the Edward Snowden whistleblower case, which continues to embarrass America mm. internationally. How does he deal with that as well? Yeah, so I think that in his second term he's got all these issues, but he's got the luxury now of picking his fights, whereas in his first term he didn't. He was handed the GFC crisis, he was handed Iraq and Afghanistan, and he spent most of his first term cleaning up those messes, extracting himself. Um, from those, those policy legacies of his predecessor. And in his second term now he can choose when he wants to engage in these issues. So on things like immigration, he's decided to play uh, you know, a quieter role in letting the lawmakers lead that fight. Um, on Snowden, um, he's been a little bit boisterous, but he's not getting too involved mm. um, because he needs China and Russia um, as allies in places like Syria. There are some things, you mentioned Syria, some things he can't avoid. Syria, where there has been a constant call for the US to show leadership, even intervene. Mm. Uh, the ousting of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, America supposedly supporting democracy in the region. How does he juggle these types of issues and, and avoid not being dragged into this mess in the Middle East? Yeah, you see, but he's also been very selective in how and when he's getting involved um, in these conflicts. So he's heavily so in, involved in Libya. In Libya, but once again, he took a bit of a backseat role. Um, the US military went in and um, basically suppressed um, Libyan air defences, but then he handed over to the Europeans mm. to do most of the cleaning up. Um, in Egypt, he knew that if he came out and he was too too vocal, then this could actually work against the forces that he was trying to aid. Um, and now in Syria, he's, it's always about the day after Assad. I mean, what is going to be left? And if he comes out at, what, too forcefully in um, in support of the democratic forces, then this might work against those forces as well in, in the long run. The problem for him as well is that to support democracy Democracy would often mean supporting Islamist parties, the very parties that uh, are often hostile to Western values and to the United States itself. Mm. Also, to, to overthrow the Assad regime means supporting the, the, the rebels, many of them hardline Islamists. So the US also walking a very fine line. Yes, and in Syria they're also thinking about, well, what happens after Assad? That there's probably going to be another conflict mm. between more, the secular domestic forces and many of the international forces and the more Islamic forces in Syria. So how is the United States going to be positioned for the day after Assad? Um, and this is really perplexing for the United States. How do you support one side in this conflict when once you hand over weapons and other, other material, you just don't know where it's going to end up? Is there a risk here that Obama ends up standing for nothing? He was someone who came in, as you say, handed the problems of, of the Bush administration, which was Iraq, Afghanistan, the global financial crisis, uh, and now into his second term, as you say, trying to pick and, and choose his own fights. But what is the Obama presidency about? Mm. And I think that in uh, the short term, this could be how history remembers Obama's second term, that they see that 
he came in and there was huge expectations about change, that he was going to bring in a whole new era of American politics, and there just wasn't all that much change. There wasn't that much to show mm. for it. However, in the long run, I think that when historians go into um, the accounts and look behind the scenes, he's probably been more involved than what we give him credit for at present. Um, many people are already making the comparisons with Dwight Eisenhower, Eisenhower. Yeah. Uh, where he had this invisible hand behind the scenes, that he was engaged with every, everybody, he was always on the phone, always engaged, but at the time people thought that he was dis disconnected, that he was passive, and many of the same criticisms that mm. are now being uh, fielded at Obama were also fielded at Eisenhower at the time. If he is involved, it's certainly a very light hand, isn't it? Because one of the criticisms of Obama is that he is very aloof to the point of even appearing superior mm. and doesn't like the business of politics. Yeah, he, he likes to sort of see himself as above um, po you know, the day-to-day -day politics, but I think that this has to do with just the nature of politics these days too with the 24-hour news cycle that if he gets involved with everything all the time that he gets dragged down to the level of just being another commentator that his voice can be lost in in, in the, the rank of, mm. of, of, of the media whereas if he's more selective in what he he supplies his voice behind, um, it has more power and more influence. But he, he, he's not a, a great persuader in the style of a Clinton though, is he? Oh, that's right, and this is one of the big criticisms. Um, he does do a very good speech um, mm. and sort of laying out um, you know, these, his coming uh, few years, uh, his, his State of the Union addresses are n typically pretty good. Um, however, it's the follow-through that he's criticised for, that he doesn't then go in and really bring the community along with well, him. He, and in, then in his last State of the Union, he talked up immigration, he talked up gun control. What's happened? Yeah, well, gun control fell down. Um, he sent in Joe Biden, his vice president, to push that through, and that fell dead. Um, on immigration, he has had some success um, in the Senate, although it wasn't him. Um, and I think that this has to go with also the nature of American politics now too, where if he supplies his voice behind a, a particular policy position, he knows that half of the Congress is just automatically going to be against it. Mm. That um, the polarization of American politics means that um, if he does supply his voice, uh, towards a policy position, it's going to be even more difficult to push it through sometimes. And, and this, this is interesting for him because he is someone that has won elections but not been able to win over his opponents in Congress. Uh, other presidents have been able to do that. What's mm. been holding him back? Um, so I think that it, it has a, a lot to do with just the, um, the partisanship that mm. we now see in American politics, that no matter what position that he takes, the opposition are always going to take the, oppo the opposite effect. It's becoming more tribal. And we see this on the surveillance um, mm. side as well, whereas when we see that um, we do the opinion polling on whether you believe that the American government is taking too much liberty in the surveillance, then Democrats tend to like the Democratic president, but had all sorts of criticism towards George W. Bush um, and vice versa now. Um, so you see that you know, people trust the government, or the supposed government that they vote in, although the government itself is doing very similar things across dif mm. different presidents. They're doing similar things, but whether or not somebody supports it or is against it has to do with who's in the White House. What do you think, it's a lost still a long way out, there's a few years to go yet, but what do you think Obama would be looking for to leave his mark? What do you think he would imagine his legacy to be beyond the historical legacy of being the first black president? Mm. I think um, in domestic politics, his first term successes on health care reform mm. is a huge uh, feather in his cap. In his second term, he'll be very happy to be able to push through immigration reform, uh, two things that his predecessors haven't been able to do. Um, on the international sphere, I think that if he can reorient the United States more towards the Pacific, um, mm. this, this great pivot towards Asia, um, as, all, as, as well as maybe trying to push uh, a little bit, Russia a little bit more towards um, decreasing the number of nuclear weapons. I think that those two things on the foreign policy front would be a huge success as well. So, and as you know, foreign policy is a lot easier for a president in the second term than having to try to deal with an often hostile Congress. That's right. Adam, good to have you on the program once again. Thank you so much for that. Thank you.